I'm a little bit alarmed to know that I have one person I'm addressing in the room. Um, this talk actually began as an email message uh, that I sent to the CEO of a climate tech company that I am invested in. Uh, that guy had just gone out and raised a bunch of money and was confronted with the need to construct a board of directors. And so he asked me for advice on how to do that. I, I wrote up the email, uh, and then I wound up sharing it with a couple other companies that I'm working with, tweaked it up a little bit. Um, I pitched it to Steve as a topic for this conference, and he agreed that I could give the talk. Um, I, hang on, I'm gonna see what time it is right now. Okay, I wanna be sure I stay on time. Um, I took that yes as an opportunity to turn my email into a novella. Uh, and I'm gonna read that to you guys now. Uh, I will post the URL and the paper that it, it points to up here at the end of the talk, but in the meantime, you can just stare at me and not stare at the screen. I'm an entrepreneur, a lot of people in the room are entrepreneurs. I know that we all agonize over who's gonna be our co-founders, right? We really think hard about who we wanna work with, who we wanna go through the maelstrom of creating a company with. And when we hire people into our companies, we likewise are super thoughtful about it. We look for talent, we look for skill, we look for chemistry. Everybody that I know is by contrast remarkably passive about a board of directors. A lot of times you think, well, you know, we took money from some venture firm and they assigned me someone. And so I guess that person is gonna be on my board. I think the reason that people don't take this as a real serious responsibility is that they don't understand what a board of directors is for. So that is what I wanna to talk to you about today. When you start a company, you hire a law firm, they ship you a big old stack of papers and you sign a bunch of them. One of the documents in there is bylaws, and the bylaws encode the local uh, business code of whatever state, city you live in. Um, in the bylaws, without fail, there's a requirement that you have a board of directors. Uh, and there are some responsibilities the board has by law. Those include, generally, hiring and firing the CEO, setting the strategy, deciding what the business is gonna go do and then making sure that it can go do that stuff. And the main, reason, the main way they make sure of that is by hiring and firing the CEO. Uh, board members are required to protect shareholder interests. They have a duty of care so that they gotta arrange that they're not stealing money from people who put money into the business, for example. Uh, and then there are a bunch of governance responsibilities. You gotta get audited periodically, you gotta meet regularly and keep notes and so on. Those are the legislated requirements, the bylaws that govern a board of directors. Uh, and they're important. There are real serious legal obligations in there. In fact, if you ever create a board of directors, one of the first things you should do is go buy directors and officers insurance, DNO insurance. You are personally, your board members are personally at legal risk if bad things happen in the business. And the DNO policy basically gives you some money to pay for lawyers in the event that some of that bad stuff transpires. But really the bylaws are a lot of paper. They wind up getting tossed in a drawer and not read very often. Because face it, it's hard work to start a business. You're super busy, you gotta figure out what the product's gonna be, you gotta build it and then test it with customers, you gotta go out and find customers and close deals and you gotta plan finances and it's hard. You're super busy doing day-to-day -day run the business stuff. The board of directors is also important there. Now I said a little bit ago that people are super thoughtful about their co-founders and they're super thoughtful about their leadership teams and that's true. When you hire people onto your leadership team, you want smart folks who challenge your thinking and who you want to be in the room with when stuff goes sideways. You want people who are gonna help you come up with new ideas to run the business. If someone can't do that, they don't belong on your leadership team. I would argue that a board of directors is really an adjunct leadership team. You want that same collection of skills, commitment, ability in your board members. Uh, they should have the experience, they should have the background to uh, dive in and help you 
when stuff goes sideways. A good board member ought to be useful in the ordinary course of events, but ought to be able to contribute meaningfully in times of crisis. So who should be on a board? What kind of people do you go after that, that meet those requirements? Um, well, first of all, the CEO always has to have a board seat. I generally recommend to small companies that you also put one other insider, one other common shareholder on the board. Usually it's a co-founder or a member of your leadership team. Frankly, it's because when you're really tiny and you get one outside board member, usually an investor, it's nice to have two of you from inside the company to vote more than the one guy can vote. So you got a little bit more control over your short-term destiny. Um, also, that seat is nice to move around people on the founding team or on the leadership team over time, recognize their contributions, make them feel like they're part of the team. So there's two of you from inside the business. Uh, if you decide to go raise money, it will certainly be the case that the investors will insist on a board seat. Not always true if you're raising small amounts of angel money, but if you're taking a significant amount of capital, the investors will want a seat. And if you raise a bunch of money and the investors don't want a seat, you have dumb investors and you shouldn't take their money. When Christoph and Amr and Jeff and I were founding Cloudera, um, Ping Lee at Axel Partners had come up with a conviction on his own that big data and Hadoop in particular was gonna be a really big deal. And he was gonna go fund a company that commercialized that technology, that made all that Google analytic power available to traditional enterprises. Given his conviction, given his deep desire to fund that, it made good sense for us to take his money. He had thought through stuff, he really understood why we wanted to do what we wanted to do. Hey, by the way, I didn't want some competitor taking his money. So he was an ideal Series A investor in Cloudera. Not long after that, uh, we got an inbound offer from a different venture firm uh, to basically lead our B round. Now we didn't need the money at that point, but we thought we probably would need it in the next year or so. Uh, sat down and talked to Ping, and he suggested that we run a quick process. Uh, go talk to maybe five or eight other venture firms, see if there was interest, get a market price on the round. So we polished up pitch deck and walked around Sand Hill Road, uh, talked to a bunch of good companies, but I fell wildly in love with Anil Bushri at Greylock. Uh, Anil was a full partner at Greylock, that's his full-time job, but a legendary operator. In the past, he had co-founded and pardon me, run uh, PeopleSoft with Dave Duffield. Uh, and while he was a partner at Greylock, his side hustle was he had co-founded another company, Workday, with Duffield, and was co-CEO there. This is a guy who had run stuff for real. He understood how to hire and fire. He knew what kind of problems CEOs have. I wanted him very badly on my board of directors. Now, when you're raising around, of course, you've got to get the best economics you can get. We managed to put together a round from Greylock that did that. It gave the shareholders the best deal that they could get. But most of all, from my point of view, I got a Neil Bushry on my board. Even if you don't raise money, I'd argue you, you still want good, smart board members who can help you solve problems. Um, it's pretty common for companies to bring on independent board members. So insiders, you and your co-founder, you're not independent, you're deep in the business. Investors, they're not independent, they got money riding on this thing. But someone from the industry or outside who is willing simply to serve on your board, doesn't have money of their own and it isn't on your payroll, that is an independent investor. Uh, and those folks are very useful. Uh, when I was at Sleepy Cat, uh, we brought on two independent, uh, independent board members. One was a guy I had served on a board for a biotech company with, uh, and he had really helped negotiate a sale of that business to a very big biotech company, uh, and then we wound that down, so I knew he had spare time on his hand. Uh, and the other was a guy named uh, Clyde Johnston. Clyde was the CEO of my largest customer at Sleepy Cat. They got bought by Sun Microsystems, and so Clyde was out of a job. I didn't want to lose his expertise, his uh, 
ideas, and so I asked him to serve on my board. Um, what kind of questions did I ask myself? What kind of questions uh, do I recommend you ask yourself if you're putting a board together? The first one is what I did with Anil, what I did with Clyde. Has this person ever run anything before? An actual CEO who has hired and fired, who knows what a marketing department looks like, is going to be a source of really valuable advice to you. Uh, that person can tell you how to do your job better. And particularly if you're a technical person starting a company, you didn't learn that stuff in school. Finding someone who can be a mentor in that way is super useful. Uh, sorry about this. Just an anecdote on, uh, on that point as mentorship. So Cloudera, when we were very young, was an absolute rocket ship. Big data was taking off. Uh, everybody knew that this Google stuff was magical. Um, the company was growing way faster than anything I'd ever seen before. Sleepy Cat had been entirely uh, bootstrapped. We didn't take any outside capital. Uh, so riding a venture-backed rocket ship was a new deal for me. I had a crazy Bay Area commute. I, I, I drove 90 minutes each way every day to get to and from work. Um, on my long commute home, I established a habit about once a week of calling Anil Bushri, the gray luck guy I told you about before. And I would talk about whatever ball of hair was top of mind for me at that time. He would challenge me. He would present options and talk out the possibilities with me. He made me a much better CEO. To the extent that Cloudero was a good company, it was largely due to the coaching that I got from Anil on those long drives. Having someone on your board that can give you that kind of uh, insight and support is hugely valuable. So ask if they've run stuff. The second question that I think you ought to ask uh, when you're assessing uh, potential board members what connections do they have? Who can they introduce me to? Um, you ought to be able to get in front of partners, in front of customers. Board members ought to be able to help you find good executive hires as well. Their Rolodexes ought to be able to pull people in that can be useful to the business. Uh, partners in a venture firm always can introduce you to the rest of their portfolio companies, and that's useful, that's cool. Um, they can also, though, put you in front of uh, groups of potential customers. So Greylock used to do these bus tours. They would get CIOs from large enterprise companies, uh, bring them to Sand Hill Road. They would pass out free fleeces and ball caps. They would feed them sandwiches and sodas. Uh, and then they would invite all the portfolio companies, CEOs, to come in and pitch them. I got huge sales leads out of that Thing, out of uh, those events. I got to uh, get introduced to potential buyers uh, and kick off uh, evaluation process that were very, very valuable. Um, we also took some, funny, some funding from InQtel. Uh, that was long ago the investment arm of the CIA, and now it represents DOD and the intelligence community generally. Those guys run a really great CEO summit in uh, San Jose uh, every year. Uh, Key leaders from different mission-focused organizations come to town, show up at a hotel downtown. Uh, they helped me, InQtel helped me, line up good meetings with people who needed the kind of analytical software that we were building. It was a huge chance for me to get in front of those folks. InQtel also helped me service that market, understand what it meant to hire and uh, manage cleared personnel, for example. Uh, so that was, uh, that was super valuable. Uh, these days also lots of venture teams, uh, venture firms have platform teams, like they've got HR and recruiting help that they can give you. I think that's nice. Uh, I think that you ought to take a hard look at it when a venture firm pitches that to you as a super useful thing. Uh, if you need the services that they specifically offer, that's good. Uh, Specifically, when you're looking at independent members, uh, contacts can be critical. Uh, they can know the uh, executives in industry, especially customers, if they are from your industry, that you're going to want to get in front of. I remember at one point uh, at Cloudera, we were in the boardroom talking about partnerships, and we realized that it would be super useful if we could get in touch with the CEO of a particular Fortune 50 firm. And one of my board members 
piped up, oh, I, I've got her mobile number. That was really nice. Um, third question that you should ask about potential board members uh, is critical. Can they help? Are they smart? Do they understand the technology, the market? When you have problems, will they be people that you turn to? Uh, are they going to be able to make a meaningful difference? In 2006, we sold Sleepy Cat to Oracle. Uh, and getting to that decision was really, really hard. We had a great business. It was profitable. We liked running it. Our problem was we were undercapitalized. My board member, uh, Clyde Johnston, the guy from Innosoft, got bought by Sun, helped me work through that very difficult decision in a really constructive way. We talked about all the possibilities, just go raise money, sell the business, take on debt. Uh, if it hadn't been for him, I don't think we would have run a successful process or found as good a home for the business as we did. When we signed that term sheet, by the way, so Oracle decided they wanted to buy Sleepy Cat, first time I'd ever sold a business, first time I'd ever been a CEO, uh, Oracle wanted to run due diligence on the business the way you do in M&A. And I had no idea what that was about. I had never seen such a thing before. The corp dev team at Oracle quickly realized that I had no clue what I was doing, and they began to freak out a little bit. My other independent board member, uh, uh, Guy Henshaw, just showed up at the office one day and started doing due diligence with me. And he stuck around until we got all the way through the process. Uh, that was super, super helpful. So a board member that can pitch in in that way makes a big difference. I said earlier that uh, you want smart people, uh, and I think that's right. Um, I want to emphasize, I think it's really important that you also like and trust your board members. You're going to be working with them when stuff goes sideways. If pressure gets high, shared trust is important. The very first governance responsibility I mentioned for a board of directors is that they hire and fire the CEO. That's entirely appropriate, but also if you're the CEO, you want to believe that the people you're bringing onto your board have the wisdom and the compassion to deal with that decision well in the event that they need to make it. So you really want to find people that you like and trust. Uh, Last on the list, not really last in priority, but just last on the list, um, I think you want to find people who have, I, I, I think, you must find people who have skills that you require. Uh, if you're in a regulated industry, you probably want someone who understands that regulation. If you've got legal complexities or a legal side to your business, you may want someone with a legal background. If you're selling enterprise software, someone who has skills at selling enterprise software. But putting those skills on your board gives you that depth and the ability to help out uh, in ways that I described before. So I talked a little bit about who ought to be on your board. Let me talk briefly about what you ought to talk to your board about. The board's responsibilities are primarily strategic. They decide what the company ought to go do. The management team decides how to do that. They're responsible primarily for tactics. Uh, some strategic questions I can imagine asking. What should our mix of direct and channel revenue be? We've got teams in Europe and in North America. I'm the CEO. We don't have infinite money. I've got to allocate capital between those places. How should I think about building the teams in the different places to get the right people, to drive good margins, but also to be sure that we've got the skills to succeed in those markets? Uh, is it time for us to add a major new functional organization? Is it time to add dedicated sales or uh, product marketing? Those are questions that a board can absolutely help out with. Anything about fundraising and option pool expansion, anything bearing on equity in the business, of course, they have to be consulted on. Um, if you're hiring a C-level executive, you've got to have the board's buy-in there. C-level executives have authority that let them do stuff that can lead to claims under your DNO policy, so you want to be sure that the board is weighed in. And the board has to like your, your leadership team. You can hire a CFO that your board doesn't like, but your, your life will suck if you do. Um, 
you can see that the stuff I was talking about are sort of big bet the business questions. Here are some questions that I think would be terrible to ask your board. Do we allow people to work remotely? What is our release cadence? Uh, do we need a new line manager in sales or in engineering? Strategic questions ask, where are we going? Tactical questions ask, operational questions ask, how do we get there? You and your leadership team are responsible for operations. The board is responsible for strategy. You should be very, very careful what questions you ask your board of directors because it's a room full of smart people. They will absolutely weigh in on anything you ask them. If you ask them tactical questions, they will give you something between advice and orders. You can ignore their advice at some risk, but you cannot ignore their orders. Remember, they hire and fire the CEO. For that reason, you should only bring them questions where you crave their advice or you need their orders. And you should think about the meeting agendas you put together in order to be sure that you're asking the right stuff. Uh, in the presentation that I'll share with you later, uh, I've got a long section on how to run a good board meeting. It gets very, very granular. Um, I just want to make a few points uh, in the spoken remarks. Um, you want to meet often enough, but not too often. We started out at Sleepy Cat and Clutter meeting monthly, uh, and that was way too often. Quarterly turns out to be often enough, because if you need to, you can always pull the board together. And a board meeting is a huge amount of work to prepare for. So you don't want to put yourself and your team to that much effort if you don't require it. It's also unlikely that you're going to have big strategic questions every single month. Maybe in your very earliest year, you might. But uh, most often, strategy is going to survive for a while. Um, you should get materials out to your directors two, one or two weeks ahead of time, and you should talk through the agenda and the materials with the individual board members before the meeting, one-on-one, -on -one, call them up or Zoom with them. Uh, if they've got any uh, agenda topics they want to add, of course you've got to do that, but you should explain why you want to cover that material. Um, when I run a board meeting, I always start out with an executive session, me and the other board members in the room. I tell them what they're going to hear that day, what I want them to pay attention to. We're going to bring in some of the leadership team to present. Here's where I want you to push them a little bit. Here's what I'd like you to ask them. And, and hey, by the way, we think that Sarah did a fantastic job. A little bit of praise from the board would really make her feel good. Then the leadership team comes in. They do their work. We have a good board meeting. We, talk, we do a review of status up front. We present our metrics. But that's a short part of the meeting, 20 minutes if we can do it. Uh, and then the bulk of it is on the large strategic discussions that we want to have. I end the meeting with another executive session. Everybody goes out except for the board members, including the CEO and the other common seat. We discuss how the meeting went. And then me and the other insider leave. And the remaining board members have what I call a closed session. And they get to talk among themselves about us. Always afterwards, uh, I want someone in the room to give me a call and give me whatever readout I needed from that. But the key here is it's important for the board to be able to speak candidly among itself in order for the business to operate well. So I try to craft the meeting agenda so that that's possible. Now, I said you want your board to meet quarterly, uh, and I think that's right. But from time to time, something seriously bad is going to happen and you're going to want to lean on your board, even for operational stuff. Uh, Walter Isaacson has a great anecdote about uh, a board situation at Apple. So in 2010, the iPhone 4 came out. And of course, it was a beautiful Joni Ive-inspired piece of hardware, and everybody loved it. Uh, but it turned out, when you picked it up and held it in your hand, your carrier connection went to zero. You had no bars at all. Apple's a new, oh, and by the way, people noticed that because back then people still made phone calls, right? Um, Apple's initial reaction was to tell everybody that they were holding their phones wrong. Uh, that didn't go over well, right? We'd all given Apple a pile of our money. We had phones that couldn't make phone calls. Uh, that led to a scandal called Antenna Gate. Uh, Jobs called the Apple board together for a marathon all-day session to decide what they were going to do. 
like short term, how are we going to solve this problem? We don't want to recall all these phones, pardon me. Longer term, we've got uh, supply chains and we've got a hardware design and we've got a whole bunch invested in our manufacturing infrastructure. And if we're going to have to change all that, it's going to be super expensive. And we need to do some crisis comps here. Well, the board decided, first of all, let's give everybody a case. That'll be easy. Second, somebody's going to have to go redesign that thing and move the antenna a little bit away from whatever inductive field a hand has. Uh, and let's acknowledge that this is a problem. They did a fantastic job. And uh, I think a bunch of us are still carrying these devices around uh, as a result. You guys can maybe barely see the URL line at the top. but. Um, I posted this talk at www.olsons.net slash entrepreneurship slash what dash is dash a dash board dash four. Uh, and you're free to take a look. I hope you'll share it around with uh, folks you work with. I think it's useful. The m message I want to leave you with is that we're all very careful about who we start businesses with. We are all careful about our co-founders. We're all careful about who we hire. Um, I think CEOs need to be exactly as careful about who they put on the board. A good board can be a major asset to a company, and a bad board can be a major drag. The board does hire and fire the CEO, but a critical job for a good CEO is to hire a good board. Let me check something. All right, that's the talk Steve told me I could give. Steve also told me that I had 30 minutes, and I haven't burned it all yet. Uh, so I'm going to give Steve a little surprise. I have a bonus talk I'm going to give. It's very, very short. Um, I don't know if this is permitted, but I'm going to proceed until apprehended. <laughs> all right, so about a year ago, it struck me that it's super weird that the second is the only fundamental unit of time that we have. For everything else, we have lots of scales, lots of quantity, quanta you get to choose from. There's kilos and, 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 and pounds and stone. There's, there's liters and gallons. Uh, and in, pardon me, in general, there is some good metric unit that you can do arithmetic on in your head. And for seconds, for time, that's really not true. All we have is seconds, and they're a total pain. They're sexagesimal, so there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour. And then if you go from seconds and minutes to hours you want to go to a day, that's 24. Uh, there's no way you're doing that arithmetic in your head. By the way, do you guys know why uh, it's 12 and 24? I'm going to teach you how to count like a Babylonian. You have four fingers. You have three segments on each finger. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That is historically why there are 12, 24 hours in a day and a full day. Uh, we're still using that brain-damaged approach to measure distance to pulsars and to count the clock speed of supercomputers. That's just dumb. So I decided I'm going to make a metric clock. And I started talking to people. Some people try to convince me that seconds are a little bit metric because there's milliseconds and picoseconds and nanoseconds. But that's bullshit, right? Because you can't say millisecond unless you also say kilosecond. And nobody talks about kiloseconds. That's, that's a rule. You can't do it. So I decided I'm going to divide the day into 10,000 equal parts. Uh, and uh, I'm going to count them as they go by. I bought some Arduino gear and a nice little display, and I built that clock. Four-digit display, that last digit is 100 microday units. Uh, as you all know, there's 86,400 seconds in a day, uh, and that means one uh, 100 microdays is 8.64 seconds long, and I made that clock. And it was really cool. But it wasn't that useful because now I got a little metric counter going on my desk, but nobody else keeps metric time, so I couldn't schedule anything with anybody. So I decided I will add a regular clock as well. So I put an hours and minute clock on that Arduino device, and that worked real good. Then I knew what time it was, and I also felt good every time there were three zeros in the end on my metric clock. Um, 
Turns out building a clock is a major pain in the butt because you got to know what time zone you're in and you got to understand about daylight saving time. So it occurred to me that it would be good to build a solar clock that just knows where the sun is in the sky and that's how you tell what time it is. Right at 12 noon, it's as high in the sky as it's going to get. Uh, so I did a lot of research on that. And that's also pretty hard. First of all, when the sun decides to be noon depends on your longitude. Um, but that's not all. The Earth's orbit around the sun is not a circle, it's an ellipse. And so the angle to the sun changes a little bit every day, which moves noon a little bit every day. Uh, people who pay attention to this stuff have come up with a mechanism for dealing with that. It's called the equation of time, and it's exactly as cool as it sounds. So I built a solar clock that knows your longitude and computes the equation of time. And then I had a civil, a civil solar metric clock. And up, 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 up. that's what that looks like. So uh, down at the bottom, you can see this a little bit after 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Immediately above that, that is 1320 in metric, 55, 58. And above that is that day at my house, solar noon, 5147. Uh, I'm sorry, the solar time. It's a little bit after solar noon, 5147. If you look close, by the way, you'll see there's a little dot after the seven. That's because 5147 is a prime number, and I'm crazy about prime numbers. So I decided every time it's a prime number, I'm going to light it up. All right. So I made this clock. And then a lot of people started asking me for one. Uh, and they're fun to build. I printed up the case on my 3D printer, and I got to design it all. And there's lots of soldering, so it's a lot of fun. But slow and kind of expensive. Uh, it's a lot of work to build them. I realized maybe I could just write an app for my phone. So uh, I learned Swift, and I mastered the intricacies of Swift UI. And I built an Apple iPhone app that is uh, Solar, a civil solar metric clock, but that's too long a name for the App Store, so it's a multi clock. Uh, and if you want to know what it looks like, so there's your civil time, uh, there's your solar time. Uh, in fact, I think I can do this. This is live right now here at the Halo. Civil time. Uh, you'll see, by the way, I, I added sunrise and sunset uh, times. And you'll notice that civil sunset is a prime number. So this is a big day. <laughs> and then you can click over here uh, and solar time. And the reason that I wanted to give you guys this talk is that last night in my hotel room, Apple told me my app was live in the App Store. So if you think that civil solar multi-clocks are cool, then you can go up here to olsons.net slash project slash multi-clock, and you'll find the link to the App Store. Uh, the code is up on GitHub under a BSD license, of course. Uh, and I would love any feedback. And by the way, if you think this is interesting, come and find me, because I will talk your ear off about this. Thank you, Steve. That's my bonus talk.